I'm Ashton Addison from the Crypto Coin Show, and today on Blockchain Interviews, we have Victor Wong, Founder and Chief Product Officer of Block Apps. Victor, thanks for taking the time, and great to see you here today. Oh, thank you, Ashton. Thanks for having me. You're very welcome. Excited to dive into the real-world asset space in blockchain uh, and what you and the team at Block Apps have been building. I know you've been in the space for a long time. I would love to hear a little bit more, first of all, about your background in business and blockchain and how that led up to Block Apps. And then we can dive into all the latest information. Okay, great. Um, well, I guess um, I've been a long time participant in the space. Um, I helped with the launch of the Ethereum public blockchain. And mm. then from there, we really focused on um, real world adoption of blockchain by primarily focusing on private blockchains and enterprise adoption. So mm -hmm. we built many of the first um you know, blockchain applications used by enterprises using Ethereum technology. And over time, uh, we, we, we created a fairly large business growing and working with those enterprises. But, you know, in, in sort of the more recent times, we realized that we think the real adoption, mainstream adoption of blockchain is not going to come primarily through private blockchains, but mm -hmm. really through, um, public blockchains and because enterprises are now getting comfortable with, you know, putting some of their workloads on public blockchain. Um, the example is the announcement by BlackRock this week. So mm -hmm. we, we saw that trend over a year ago and we made that kind of pivot toward the RWA space. Mm. Yeah, it's very interesting. And it's amazing to be at the inception of, of Ethereum and see and be actually helping build out that mainstream adoption, it's interesting to see that transition from uh, major companies, they want to get involved with this, but in the way that they do it, you know, private Ethereum blockchains are, are not the Ethereum that we see on, on CoinMarketCap. Um, right. but they, they're using the technology, uh, but it was just a matter of time before they get comfortable uh, with something that you know, eventually will likely be a multi-trillion dollar or more uh, market um, a, a alone. Um, and the real world asset space is one of the major use cases for Ethereum. Of course, there's so many, uh, but I know that I feel like it's one that is yet it, it's, it's on the cusp of that hockey stick effect. You know, we've, yep. we've heard of obviously the finance industry, uh, which will also be tokenized into, into real world assets, but other things that you wouldn't normally think of, of being tokenized, uh, are now like people are getting comfortable with Ethereum technology to be like, hey, we should tokenize all of this other stuff because there's incredible benefits there as well. Yeah, and and that's so. What we saw is like really, you know, at, at Block Apps, and and this kind of transitions into what we're doing at Block Apps. When we made the tradition, we when we made the transition away from the enterprise private blockchain market, um, you know, what what we were doing in that market for Fortune 500 companies, governments, you know, all of these big clients was really we were taking real world assets and tokenizing them mostly for like supply chain use cases. Mm -hmm. So we started off with basic Ethereum, but had to add all these features in order to make it work for these kind of use cases. And, you know, some of those things include identity, changes to the consensus algorithm, how to model them in smart contracts. So that's some of the work that we had kind of previously did. And what we saw is that as kind of these companies and kind of started to move toward the public blockchain space, but also as the kind of mainstream adoption kind of petered off a bit. And we, we see, you know, at BlockApps, we say our mission is to onboard the next 1 billion blockchain users by offering them rare and valuable things. What, mm -hmm. what we mean by that is, you know, like it has to be something that someone would buy, whether or not blockchain was involved or not. Mm -hmm. And you use the blockchain aspects to make it more enticing to them by either giving them lower cost by fractionalizing or, you know, making it more available for like secondary market trading. So that, mm -hmm. that's really what we're focused. And to do that, we've kind of launched our own Ethereum derived blockchain with these extra features mm -hmm. that we call Strato Mercado. Hmm. Oh, very interesting. I'd love to dive into that a little bit uh, later as well. And um, great insights into the RWA space. I, I know that eventually, you know, the entire stock market and hopefully every car and every building will be tokenized. It's just a matter of which are the assets that are ready 
and the people that are ready to understand and buy those assets first as yeah. all the entire world of assets gets transitioned into blockchain. What do you think are some of the ripe areas in what types of assets are most fit to become the early adopters of tokenization for people to buy and trade? Right. So, I mean, you have where things started, you know, the earliest RWAs or stable coins, right? And, you know, really what we think about it is that it's, it's things that people can understand and also want access to. So part of our thesis is that we want to kind of, there, there are whole classes of assets that we want to democratize that currently normal people don't have access to. Like, you know, for example, um, just as an example, most of these are like high value assets. Let's say you had the money and you want to buy, you know, a high end piece of art or commercial real estate. Now you, probably wouldn't necessarily know exactly where to go to do this. And that's assuming you have the money. Most people don't have the money. So how can we bring it down um, to make it available to most people? And you know that's where we're using the blockchain ability to fractionalize and de-risk it by allowing people to you know sell it when they want to um, as kind of like the benefit. So we sort of lead with the assets and classes of assets that we've seen already are are like think of anything that, the wealthy have access to to their portfolios that most normal people don't have. So I mentioned a couple there. You know, art we've looked at, but um, you know that's not our main focus. Metals is another. Um, you know, commercial real estate, for example. Um, there are so many collectibles we've started with. Like there are so many of these sort of areas that we're kind of looking into now. And you know, pretty much from everyone we talk to, they're really interested in kind of moving in this direction. Mm -hmm. It's very cool. And I love that as more people are interested in investing in different types of assets, for the example that you gave about you know, art or real estate, you know, 99% of the world can't go buy a skyscraper all out. You know, they want to get 1% or 0.1% of it. And I think that's where tokenization really comes into play, lowering the barriers for entry. Um, but I think even middle, medium priced or lower priced assets, there still are a lot of benefits for tokenization or just the liquidity, the transparency and being able to move something or own it digitally and buy it from somebody across the world uh, without having yeah. to, you know, go through all the logistics of, of figuring out how you're going to move this precious piece of art. You know, mo most people that are investing in something, they don't necessarily have to have it in their possession to own it if they own it on the blockchain. Yeah, I, I think that's the core piece of the blockchain that most people don't talk about. I think the core function in terms of real world assets of blockchains is really to separate ownership from possession, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't necessarily need to own something in order to reap the benefits of trading or, you know, reselling it. And mm -hmm. we've seen this kind of happen on an industry level already. Like, you know, you can think of commodities future markets. They already mm -hmm. do this. Mm -hmm. um, you can think of, you know, in the sneaker market, they already do this where there are consignment vendors that hold the actual item. And then you can retrade those items without having the friction of having to ship it every time. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we're taking that and kind of generalizing it. Our ultimate vision is to be able to kind of take any tradable real world asset, put it on the blockchain and be able to kind of reap these benefits of like the whole having a tradable digital entity because it can move very fast, can be more reliable. And like, like we said, it can kind of allow you to lower the costs of having a partial ownership without having to buy the whole thing. Mm -hmm. And I was looking into the block apps marketplace, some of the different types of real world assets that the team is starting with. So carbon in there, metal, mm -hmm metals and and collectibles. I'm curious on the metal side, I feel like personally it's a great, you know, diversification to have some kind of metals in your portfolio as well. Can you talk about the difference of people that have been traditionally buying metals or even digitally buying them from somebody versus on the tokenization marketplace? Yeah, so really it's about, you know, kind of like um when you buy any kind of token, um we basically allow you to kind of resell it right away right so mm. which makes it much more easy like part of the part of the issue with things like metals is 
they can be very heavy and bulky to ship in volumes. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to move around. Even a thousand ounces of silver is, mm -hmm. a, you know, close to 80 pounds. Like it's a big mm -hmm. bar and the shipping costs alone are enormous. I mean, people complain mm -hmm. about gas costs. Like if you just <laughs> think about the shipping costs of something like that, it's crazy, right? So mm -hmm. like, but how can you kind of adopt to a world where you can trade in something without having to have the physical thing? Mm -hmm. First of all, you have to have trust that the physical thing is being held and is real, right? So mm -hmm. in our world, and, and the way we kind of design Shroud Mercado is we have this idea of issuers. Like issuers are people that um, have been verified and are holding that physical thing. So for example, the metals we sell in Mercado today, we work with a partner, Tokeny, and for every ounce of silver, you are buying effectively shares in 100 ounce bars, which are kept in a vault. Mm. So, you know, it, it's, we've taken that idea from the stablecoin world where like asset backed stable coins, you know, and BlackRock is doing this with financial instruments and applying it to real things. And we think mm. that is where, you know, as these kind of individual items move, um, people will be able to leverage the profits off it without having to buy the whole thing. And that, that's mm -hmm. what we're kind of really, really interested in. Mm -hmm. No, it's very interesting. And I'm curious for traditional investors that they invest in the stock market, they maybe not are familiar with the intricacies of blockchain or the tokenization part. What is the major difference between you know, going to the commodities exchange or on the stock market and purchasing something that they think is as close as they can get to silver versus yeah. buying it on the tokenization market? Yeah, I mean, the, the big answer to that question is, you know, when you're, it's control, right? And what, what we mean by this is that when you buy, um, it, you can definitely buy, you know, uh, ETFs of various items like this. Like it could be mm -hmm. real estate, could be art, it could be any of these categories, right? But the, you're still missing the underlying control of what you're buying, mm -hmm. right? Like you don't make the decisions. I, I want to buy this building and not this building, right? I want to buy this kind of metal or this art piece and not this art piece, right? And, you know, what we're offering is the ability to buy, um, effectively asset tokens so you buy mm -hmm. you know a component of that asset itself and it's up to you if you want to group them into a fund that's fine with you mm -hmm. uh, that's fine with us if you want to you know but like you know kind of more clearly what you're buying versus mm -hmm. sort of that fund kind of portfolio thing and you know we see that people will eventually build portfolios themselves once they're kind of given that aspect of it but they want more choice over the things to buy like you know where you buy uh, real estate, even in one city or mm -hmm. one district, can be very different. So, you know, mm -hmm. why should experts take that money? And then the next part is management fees, right? Mm -hmm. Those experts charge a lot of money to do that. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, our fees are like effectively they're transparent, right? We don't mm -hmm. we don't charge those kind of ongoing fees generally. For sure, yeah, that's definitely one part of the traditional markets is it's you know blockchain. You're lowering the fees, not just on the transaction costs, but just like holding your own assets and being able to understand uh, how much something costs. Um, I, there's a lot of benefit that I think traditional investors have yet to realize or see those benefits because they need to get into it deeper. I feel like maybe 2024 is the year that we see an explosion in real world assets moving into the portfolios of not just crypto lovers, but traditional investors as well. And we saw the huge news this week with BlackRock and other entities moving into real world asset space. Can you talk about that news, maybe elaborate and, and what that could mean for tokenization being adopted? Yeah, so I think what, you know, like that to us is sort of like the icing on the cake of a trend that we've been seeing over a long time. So, you know, when we started, as, as I said, with private blockchains and this kind of thing, what we saw that companies wanted to tokenize was like real items, whether to track it and move it. And, you know, that's something that's really important for them, right? So a lot of the things we did, like we tracked agricultural products, we tracked, you know, oil and energy products. We tracked all these kind of like um, mining kind of, uh, not like crypto mining, but like physical mining, um, you know, resources kind of thing. And we saw that there's a huge amount of value when you digitize something and understand the kind of ownership 
understand where it came from, right? And now I think people are kind of catching on to the thing is that that doesn't have to only be used by large companies. It can be used by individuals to make their buying decisions. And I think this is, you know, why BlackRock is moving into that, right? Like they're seeing that for financial instruments, this is something that's important, right? We've already seen, like I said, this happen in like the commodity spaces and other areas, but this is giving us an opportunity to move sort of illiquid assets into this. And there are so many illiquid assets in the world. Like the majority of assets are illiquid, right? If you think about things like the stock market, that's just a small part of what is available in the entire world that we could potentially tokenize. And I think BlackRock is waking up to that too. Yeah, no, it's incredible. The, the opportunities are sort of endless, you know, even just personal items, everything you own could be tokenized and then there'll be a, a, a stock market tokenization market for that, so to say, which will be crazy. And I think people will look back at the stock market and see, uh, they'll realize that it was crazy to see how inefficient and slow and, and higher cost it was than when blockchains, you know, adopt, adoption sort of becomes mainstream. Maybe it takes a, a few years or five or a decade um, or a few decades to get everything on. Uh, but I feel like, it starts slow and then it moves up a lot quicker. And you know, to discussion around tokenization, especially of, of real estate and metals and commodities, has been around. But it's just lowering the other barriers to entry, whether it's understanding blockchain technology or the user experience or actually getting the old world transition to the new world. There's all these barriers. So, do you think that that is you know is is there it's hard to put a time frame on it, but is there a mm. time frame in when we start seeing capital, more capital than before moving into the space? Yeah, so I, I really think, I mean, being around as long as I have, you you see these waves, right? So you saw the launch mm -hmm. of Ethereum and then, you know, um, it held steady for a really long time and then you had the ICO boom. And then, you know, another crypto winter, then you saw the NFT boom, right? And then, mm -hmm another crypto winter. And then, so what I think is driving the kind of activity now is really the kind of realization that blockchain can be used for things that are effectively asset backed tokens, right? People, you know, the, the one question when I talk to non crypto natives about tokens, they always say, well, what am I actually buying? Like what's behind this thing? Right. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, you know, like, I, I definitely understand blockchain as well as anyone, but like, you know, at the end of the day, I have to say, well, it's network computational power or map or some mm -hmm. answer like that. Mm -hmm. And that's not a satisfying answer to most people. So I think ultimately what needs to happen and what companies like ourselves and what companies like BlackRock are really saying is that what we need to do is find things that people want to buy, regardless of whether they're on the blockchain or not. Right. Mm -hmm. the, and if we can do that, if we can make that, then, you know, we don't have to lead with blockchain. We can have go for it. And I really think we're moving into the next era of what I would call the RWA era, right? Mm -hmm. Like all of these things are kind of moving in this direction. And they're going to be asset-backed stable coins of all kinds of stripes and varieties. It's a great explanation, Victor. And yeah, when I also try to explain blockchain, because it's a new asset class, and it can't really be defined uh, from traditional economic uh, explanations. Right. It's it's hard to explain because you can't just go back to an old textbook and, and read that. It's something that's completely new. Um, and l I like what you said there about buying an asset that's on the blockchain. As long as they don't have to understand the blockchain and they don't know, they don't need to know the underlying technology. I feel like because it's more novel, people. They get interested, but then it gets confusing, and then they're like, ah, whatever. But traditional yeah. applications, or even on your banking application, people don't care what's the underlying technology. They don't need to know, you know, what was the coding language that made their banking app safe. Um, they just, they just trust it. They just use it because it's been around. Uh, and I feel like yeah, it's going to take some and, time. And for that. you know, like that's one of the ironies of the blockchain space. I mean, I'm, I'm a technologist. That, you know, I, I've started multiple tech companies, and like. I, I think one of the things is that one of the things that attracted to us to this industry is that it's about 
you know, that blockchain could provide better security and trust than other technologies available. Mm -hmm. But, you know, to the most of the regular world, blockchains have been synonymous with fraud and scams. So there's kind of, this kind of disconnect. And you use the banking example. That I think that banking example is perfectly right. You don't think about the database that the bank uses. You know, you don't think about, for example, the transaction fees that Amazon charges, mm -hmm. you, right? Like, you don't think about these things. What you think about is, can I, like, are they offering me something that I can get access to? And, and can I trust that they actually have that thing? Mm -hmm. And, you know, like, I think that's something that we haven't been focused on in the blockchain space <laughs> enough. And that's really why we, we kind of took it upon ourselves to kind of focus really on that problem. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great focus. And Victor, if I went to the marketplace uh, mm -hmm. uh, for block apps and maybe you can just explain, uh, you know, as we've sort of danced around it, I want to go there and I don't want to have to learn about blockchain. I'm personally curious on, on how it works, but understanding the user experience in making it as easy as possible or similar to what they've known in the past to be able to buy metals and understand the benefits of tokenization without having to go through a blockchain 101 course. Yeah. How would I go to the marketplace and get that done fast and easy? Yeah. So, and, and to be clear, like, you know, for example, tomorrow we're launching, um, you know, carbon neutral silver that's go, both going to be on the public Ethereum blockchain and our marketplace. So, mm. you know, we provide interfaces for both, right? Yeah. But on, you know, like we think that the experience on Ethereum and level twos for DGENs have improved dramatically. So people know how to use MetaMask, buy something, and you can do that with the assets we're offering too. Uh, you know, starting tomorrow, mm -hmm. our first of that kind of asset class is, you know, we're selling a carbon neutral silver token, um, and that's going to be available. You can buy it directly on the public Ethereum chain. Now, what the marketplace was meant to do was really provide that what I would call a web 2.5 experience for non-blockchain users, right? So like, think about, okay, how do I create an identity? How do I pay? Can I pay in the credit card? How do I, you know, under the hood work, you know, everything you buy is effectively a token. We're tokenizing it. That's all there. And all the technology is there, but we kind of wanted to hide that on the marketplace. So that's, we want to make it very, very easy for that kind of normal user to kind of be able to buy and look at what they own and that kind of stuff. And that entire process is evolving too. But, you know, that that's really what we focus on. Create an identity, buy with a credit card, be able to see what I own with that identity. Um, you know, and in many ways, it looks almost like a normal website, but under the hood, it's all, you know, blockchain derived technology. Yeah, it's really cool. A normal website but it's actually powered by the technology of the future that, that right exactly and as people get more comfortable we're moving more and we you know we kind of want to move them more and more in a blockchain -y direction right so we're going to make it feel you know even in our next release coming up it's going to feel more like an nft marketplace like mm -hmm. but you know the the average user we're going after which is sort of the more late more like early mainstream kind of user really, you know, like it's still too overwhelming for a lot of people. And if we're going to reach our goal of getting more people on the blockchain and kind of bringing more of the mainstream, we have to kind of meet them where they are today. Mm -hmm. No, I, I know that there are millions of new people that are getting crypto wallets and getting familiar with it, but it's also great to have that web 2.5 experience. And sometimes you just want to use your credit card or just, you know, build a web through. Yeah. So um... yeah, exactly, you know, like and like we want to be able to kind of use all the benefit of crypto, but, you know, make it easier. And it's funny because when I started, all the problems that we were talking about were really technology problems, right? Mm -hmm. Like we had to solve scalability. We had to, you know, solve, start to create standards like and a lot of those core technical problems are resolved now or, you know, there are. Uh, huge amounts of people working on them, which is great. Mm -hmm. But, you know, getting that normal person interested in, you know, I, I, I love all the develop, technical developments, you know, the works mm -hmm. that are being done on zero knowledge proofs, the works being done on, you know, scaling and layer twos and now layer threes, all of that is super exciting to me personally. But, you know, for my 
non-crypto friends, I have to have something for them that will get them interested. And what mm -hmm. really gets them interested is like, hey, have you ever thought about buying this really interesting thing like silver or, you know, mm -hmm. some metal you never thought of? And would you like to? And a lot of the times they were like, yes. And so blockchain to them is just a means to an end. Mm -hmm. Well said, Victor. And if people want to learn more about real world assets or how block apps is tokenizing them or try out the marketplace, buy the carbon neutral silver that's, that's coming out and, and follow along for as more types of assets get tokenized. Is there a best place to go to, to learn that or to get started? Yeah, um, you know, uh, they can come to our website, uh, blockapps.net. Um, they can follow us on Twitter at blockapps. And if you're particularly interested in buying, you know, the public Ethereum um, carbon neutral silver, mm. you can go to cns.blockapps.net. Very cool. I can leave those links in the show notes below as well. Appreciate your insights, Victor, into real world assets. Uh, with this news this week with BlackRock, I feel like we're on the cusp of something huge and more people are going to be looking for different RWA alternatives. And I feel like this is something that's coming at the perfect time. So thank you so much for coming on today and all the best with BlockApps moving forward. Thank you, Ashton. It's been great talking to you.